Hello, welcome to Philosophy Gets Schooled. I'm Simon Kirchin, a philosopher based at the University of Kent. We're recording this episode in July 2022. Today's episode is all about business ethics. So we'll be thinking about what business ethics itself is, the various relationships within businesses and between them and others, various topics such as whistleblowing and how business ethics relates to common ethical theories. We'll also see what else we get on to as always. Joining me in this episode, we have Michael Platt, who teaches at Harvey Grammar School in Folkestone. Hi, Michael. Hi, Simon. Hi, Toby. Uh, and we've got Toby Baroness, who's a teacher at St. Helen and St. Catherine's in Abingdon. Hi, Toby. Hi, yeah. Great to be here. Uh, great to have uh, both of you. Um, OK, so we're going to talk about business ethics today. For any students listening in, this topic appears on the OCR A-level specification. It isn't anywhere else. But it might be of interest to anyone if you're thinking about doing an extended essay or just because you're studying other relevant courses such as business or economics. Um, So to get us going, let's think about business ethics in general. Um, Michael, do you want to say a few words about it to get us warmed up? What are some of the main topics, questions and ideas we need to be looking out for? Yeah, happy to. Um, So I think it's important because there's nothing really like business ethics at GCSE. Now, I'm fortunate as a teacher, I did do business study. So a lot of the terminology is nice and straightforward to me. But the most basic uh, terminology I think all students need to understand is the difference between a shareholder and a stakeholder, first and foremost. So businesses will have stakeholders. That is anyone who is affected by a business. So we are all stakeholders in Google because the way they produce their algorithm, the way we access information, we're all affected by it. That can affect what information we access, etc. So decisions made in Google will affect us. So we are a stakeholder in Google. But a shareholder is obviously someone who has a financial interest in that business. So they own a part of that business, they get a windfall from that business, they have a financial interest. And I think that's the most important one when we're discussing ethics, is because obviously you can have different ethical obligations to your shareholders, stakeholders, and that's the things that businesses have to balance out. And then obviously thinking about different types of businesses. So there are numerous types of the charitable businesses, people setting up uh, businesses to raise money, to help certain causes. You've got sole traders, plumbers, electricians, those sorts of things, people who generally employ them and maybe one other person. But I think primarily when you do A-level, you're dealing with corporations. So those are big companies that have wide reach and affect a large number of people um, and have uh, duties to shareholders. And obviously, then that affects the ethics. So some um, ethical issues will affect all of those businesses, how you deal with employees and customers, and then others will be more specific. So uh, corporations will have ethical obligations to shareholders as well as all those other groups. So I think most of the conversation in business ethics is largely about corporations, but there are obviously some issues that are broader than others and some that are a bit narrower, depending on the business you talk about. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Michael. Really helpful start. Toby, anything you want to add to... Just that quick tour before we get into some of the issues themselves. I mean, I think that's a that's a great kind of kind of introduction to those key terms that we need to be thinking about. I think what's really great about business ethics, just to kind of frame it in a way that I you know often talk about with students, is we talk thinking about like Kantian ethics or virtue ethics. You know, these are kind of quite often students find abstract new ideas, but everyone is a consumer and everyone you know, in some way or another is involved in business ethics. As Michael said, we're all stakeholders in some respect or another. And a lot of these topics are, you know, relatively new. Um, You know, they've all come about in the last hundred years or so, you know, before we weren't talking about whistleblowing or globalization, corporate social responsibility. So all these things, you know, there is a relatively new branch of ethics. Great. Uh, Really helpful. Okay, so let's think about um, one important set of topics for the rest of this first segment. Uh, And Michael's just mentioned corporations, and and he's right that that the A-level spec focuses a lot on corporations, as does business ethics generally, not just A-level, but at at universities. And corporations are really interesting things, what's often referred to as group agency. And certainly I can think of lots of examples which I'll throw in later on to give us a bit of contrast but um, just thinking about that very idea of group agency before we get into the ethics of things should we just think about what what the issues are with with group agents anyone want to introduce that for us yeah i can go for it so i guess you know the 
problem with corporations is that they're they're a huge body of individuals um, who are all working together to make decisions. And obviously, you know, as we're going to discuss, some of those decisions might not be particularly ethical or they will be ethically dubious. And so it kind of brings up about that question, to what extent can the corporation itself responsible or, you know, has moral agency or is it the individuals within the corporation um, making those decisions? Uh, yeah, great. Thank you, Michael. Anything to add to that one? Yeah, I think, and it is something specific with corporations, isn't it? That they are, in my understanding, particularly in America, they are legal persons, aren't they? So the corporations can be held responsible for certain things. So the most you can really do with a corporation is fine them, or you know, that, that's about it. That's about all your legal kind of um, options are. And you can't actually imprison anyone for any actions within that corporation unless it's very specific circumstances. So I think corporations are interested in that. that legally, they shift the blame from individual moral agents to the corporation, which, I don't know, it's a bit of an uncomfortable idea that there are things in our society that are essentially acting and no one can be held responsible for that. And that's a, that's a very difficult thing, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, just some thoughts from me and and possibly actually just speaking to students, it might be an interesting exercise to get your head around the idea of group agency and what we're talking about is this. Right. So so something that, that Toby just mentioned. Right. So the idea is it's not individuals being held responsible, well, not just individuals being held responsible or even as role holders, but actually that the corporation itself. And Michael just said in the US, then corporations are, are treated as legal persons but you can't you can't imprison a a company right you can imprison people but you can't be you can't imprison a company so you have to find them or do other things so it's probably worth getting your head around when we think about corporations thinking about other sorts of group agents so i mean here's a few suggestions but it's probably worth an exercise students just making a list of different sorts of group agents well possible group agents that we might be used to so think about sports teams or think about orchestras or think about ad hoc dance troops right people just get together and just start dancing together right or pairs of dancers or right how is that similar to companies how is that different and how is how are all of those different from individuals doing things so we used to individuals being held responsible for all sorts of things so um elsewhere on various a-level specifications there's thoughts about killing and letting die and thieving and all sorts of other things what is it for companies to steal or indeed companies to kill or at least be involved in manslaughter what's going on there right so and that's the sort of thing we're thinking about so can it be the case that a company can be responsible, both legally and morally responsible, over and above a set of individuals. And that's a kind of interesting thing. Similarly, when we say things like Wolverhampton Wanderers won the match, right? Do you want to say the individuals playing for Wolverhampton Wanderers won the match? Or do you want to say the team won the match? Or you want to praise a certain band or an orchestra for performing well? rather than just the individuals playing or performing well. What's going on with those examples? It's a similar sort of thing going on, possibly, with with corporations. So what, I mean, so actually, it's just, just a question to you both, Toby and Michael. Do, do students get this fairly intuitively, or do they struggle a little bit, first of all, with just the very idea of group agency or corporation agency? I think, I think mine struggle a little bit. They struggle a little bit, because when you're judging say we do euthanasia there'll be say three or four direct people involved um, and you can identify their intentions you can identify uh, what they're hoping to achieve you can identify broadly speaking you know how they've calculated and where their moral judgments are coming from whereas with the corporation it's much more difficult to identify what a particular will is so a middle manager might have the intention of increasing profits and then he puts pressure on his employees but then the person below that might be trying to get his uh, fellow workmates to achieve their goals that they want to achieve and get them trained and get them happy at work so i think the the difficulty is you can't really 
uh, identify a single intention with a corporation. There might be people in a corporation that want to be more environmentally friendly. There might be people who are just solely there for profit. There might be people there just wanting to increase as much of their wealth as possible. There are other people who are there for philanthropic principles. Um, and it is it is very difficult. So I think the only way I really communicate it to students is when you judge a corporation, if they were your friend, if that was someone you know, if that was someone living in your community, is that someone you would hold up as a, a moral person within your community? So the way, I don't know, Google behaves as a, as a company, if they were living next door to you, would that be a neighbour that you would enjoy living next to? Or would you have certain conversations with that neighbour about their conduct and how they're conducting themselves in your own community? And that applies to any business, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Toby? Yeah, I think I think I really like that idea of um, asking your students whether you'd like to be, you know, friends with, you know, or with the type of person that company is. But yeah, I think they, in terms of group agency, they, yeah, similarly, they, they do get it. Often trouble thinking about, similarly to intention, that kind of chain of decision making within a company, you know, because often when we're looking at judging an ethical decision, we want to make, you know, this is when the ethical decision was made and this is what it is. But within a kind of a huge corporation, that's going to be a lot more difficult in terms of pinpointing exactly when it was made, how it was made, who was involved. And I guess, is you know, what you often look at when you look at examples or case studies of when companies have made you know, unethical decisions, is there a, you know, is there, is it on paper that they've decided to do that? And then it becomes quite ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah, good. So let's pause on that then for the students. So so we've introduced this idea of group agency or corporation agency. And normally when we think about individuals, let's say in a court of law or or when we're just making a moral judgment about them, we, we kind of say, well, they've got an intention, they decided to do it. And it might be something explicit that they voiced or written down or perhaps something that was in their mind and we have to gather evidence and assume that for, for what we can what, what we can assume is that they they decided to do it whether whether they profess otherwise or not but with a group like such as a corporation it might be very difficult to pinpoint any particular individual or a small group within that large group who said yes we're going to do x but it's clear that the whole company as a whole did x they did something and so the question is can we then make sense of an agency if there's no particular bit of paper or as Toby said someone's written something down where this thing was done so but some people say that um, in group agency in corporations there might be some quite interesting decision trees as it were that goes through various committees and departments this way and that way in the way that Michael was motioning to just a couple of minutes ago such that you can't make sense of how in the end the company or the corporation did X unless you make reference to the various committees and departments and roles that people have that help to form all of those decisions. So in fact, we can only make sense of there being a a, a decision and an action, which clearly happened, if we assume that there has to be some sort of group agency. So it kind of pulls in in both ways, right? You can only make sense of, of... the company doing something which it clearly has if you assume there's group agency but you can't I, you may not be able to identify any particular decision and any particular person who's made that it only makes sense if you assume a sort of corporate structure but that's that takes a little leap of imagination because we're so used to thinking about individual people making decisions and acting um, but again so it's probably worth thinking about how orchestras or musical bands play or sports teams or something like that. So it might be that the sports team as a whole doesn't decide to play a particular way to score a goal, but they end up scoring a goal, right? So how do you make sense of that? So just to take it on then what one notch, Michael and Toby, assuming that we we can make sense of group agency, what about the, the moral status then of that? So Michael introduced us to this idea of um, whether you'd want to be friends with this company or corporation. So do you want to expand a little bit more on that, on that question, Michael, and get us into this phrase, corporate social responsibility? Yeah, I guess my, my way of thinking about it, um, and I, I think about John Rawls when he talked about designing a society from behind a veil. 
And I, you have to ask yourself when you look at the world, would you design it in such a way that you have businesses whose sole aim are to make profit? Because if you have businesses in your society with the sole aim of making profit, you you have a, a, a dubious uh, motivation that is probably, I mean, maybe that's unfair, but probably going to lead to some sort of exploitation, a race to the bottom, if that is the sole purpose of a business is to increase profits for their shareholders and for themselves. And it struck, yeah, it struck me yesterday as well that I was listening to the Today in Focus podcast. They've just done a bit about Uber. And it was a bit baffling when they said that Uber need to shift to a more profitable model. And I thought, well, surely you've set up a business to have a profitable model in the first place, but obviously not. But the, the result of them moving to a more profitable model may, basically means they're squeezing their employees and they're squeezing their customers in order to then make money. Now that they've got kind of market saturation, they're now trying to make money. And from a Rawlsian perspective, is that a, an agency group or individual that you would want in your society? Or do you want to say that these businesses have genuine moral responsibilities like we do? So when we say, I want to make money, I go and find a job where I don't exploit people because I know that's wrong. I could find a job and make money that would exploit people, but I have a moral sense that I shouldn't do that. I have a moral sense that when I buy stuff at the supermarket, I want to have as little impact on the environment as possible because I have that moral responsibility as an individual. And I think corporate social responsibility is basically asserting the idea that businesses should also have those same moral concerns and we should judge them by at least a similar standard to the way we judge individual moral agents. Um, so yeah, that's the idea of corporate social responsibility, essentially. Thanks. Uh, Toby, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's um, also quite helpful to think of kind of corporate social responsibility in the different areas in which that social responsibility can be applied. Uh, so, for example, you know, in a in a legal sense, you know, we would expect corporations to abide by the laws, follow uh, regulations, you know, avoid frauds, corruption, things like that. Um, but I think we would also expect them to not just follow the letter of the law, but also go a little bit beyond that. Um, so, I, I guess a recent example of this was the fast fashion retailer Boohoo. In 2020, it was kind of revealed that in uh, Leicester, um, the, the factories in their supply chain, so they weren't owned by Boohoo, but they were uh, textile factories that they were kind of sourcing fabrics from for their clothes, and that these factories um, employed their workers for you know, well below minimum wage. I've seen you know £3.50 used, um, very dangerous working conditions, fire doors that were locked, poor sanitation, no kind of drinkable water. And so, you know, this came out and Boohoo uh, were under a lot of pressure. But Boohoo actually hadn't broken the law because all that you're required to do as a company is produce a statement on modern slavery, say, you know, and, and the company saying that they oppose it. And what are they doing to ensure that their company isn't um, using supplies that take part in modern slavery you know i guess we could probably say that boohoo maybe hadn't done due diligence in ensuring that their company had and their supply chains hadn't been involved in modern slavery um but you know whether or not boohoo were you know they were following the law they had this statement but they were kind of falling short of what we would expect or what we'd hope a company to be doing in terms of social responsibility Great, a nice example as well. I remember that that uh, story. I suppose. That, that, am I right in thinking? So, on the spec, there's something about a, a question for students about corporate social responsibility or CSR. That's is it hypocritical window dressing or yeah? So I can imagine that this is. I mean, with those ex that example you've just given, Toby. But there are plenty of others. We should say not just Boohoo, but lots of other companies. I mean, I imagine that this is something that students really get their their teeth into, thinking about whether it's just some nice nice posters and some nice leaflets and a bit of flash on a website, or whether there's actually meat to it. So, what what what, what sort of student reactions to, to the idea of CSR? Um, I can come in on that one. I play quite a fun game with my students, and unfortunately, it doesn't work in audio format. But I find the corporate social responsibility web pages of various companies, and I get them to guess what company that comes from. So they're all green, they're all beautiful, and generally they're from airlines, they're from oil companies, and none of the kids get them right because they're all we love the planet, it's great, it's fantastic, and then you find out it's an oil company or it's an airline that's just pumping 
CO2 into the air, but you would have thought it was from Greenpeace, some of the corporate social responsibility. And I think some of it is quite transparent that um, it is just for the image. It is window dressing. It's it's greenwashing for for uh, to use that term as well. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily fair for all companies. Obviously, some are more transparent than others. So as as much as McDonald's would like to have people running around playing sport. You can't get away from the fact that most people aren't picking carrot bags in their Happy Meal, um, probably. So sometimes you think it's, it's transparent, but there are companies that uh, I do, I believe, have genuine corporate social responsibility. So there are companies like Patagonia, the clothing brand that use sustainable resources, and, and you can tell that they are committed. But it is a, it's a really difficult thing. It comes back to how we judge that intention, I suppose. And it is quite difficult to work out what that intention is. And I suppose from a Kantian point of view, any action where it's we're going to do this in order to improve our image and to increase our business is always going to be suspect because it's a hypothetical imperative, isn't it? We will do this in order to increase our profit, but then you know if that doesn't become profitable anymore. Are you going to continue to do that? So it, I, it's really difficult that question on whether you can really identify. You could make a judgment, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to make a judgment with confidence about whether something is genuine or not. I might be wrong. Ronald McDonald really might care about you know football and improving fitness i genuinely don't know but there are things that just are questionable with certain companies that you do question their motivations i suppose so going back to um the way kind of both of you in different ways introduced it i suppose i've got i've got this question so there's companies set up to maximize profit i mean i suppose this goes back to the shareholder versus um stakeholder kind of issue or clash tension um, that we introduced right at the start. So, you know, companies are set up to maximise profit. You, you introduced the idea of, of Uber, Michael. And then Toby was thinking about Boohoo and thinking about, look, they've, they've uh, fulfilled their, it seems, legal duties, right? So I suppose the question is, why is it important for, for companies to have genuine corporate social responsibility? Why, why, why do we think it's, it's an important important thing for, for them to be involved in um well i get i'd go back to rules and it's like would i want to enter any part of a big corporation's supply chain probably not would i want to be producing clothes for big companies in unsafe factories in bangladesh or indonesia probably not and i think that you know you have to you have to think about the, the corporate structure and the profit making will always I say always, probably always, uh, lead to a squeeze on individuals in order to increase profit. Any time you put profit first, conditions, working conditions, um, working practices, standards will always be squeezed in terms of searching for that profit. And I think it's always a questionable aim. It can have really positive impacts as well, of course, like employment and everything else. And that is obviously the flip side. But I suppose I wouldn't want to enter in a random place in a big corporation. To be, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't fancy my chances of ending up at the top. Thanks, uh, Toby. Yeah, I guess you know we, the you know the public, would definitely want corporations to take their social responsibilities seriously, because it would create you know a better world for everyone. Right. Um, you know, if people were paid not just a minimum wage, but they were paid an actual living wage, um, if everyone's working conditions are good um, and safe, if they don't accept, you know, damage the environment, you know, all of those things, you know, it's in everyone's interest for us to for, for corporations to kind of take that seriously. Um, but I guess the the cynical side of me would then question, you know, from the corporation's point of view. Um, why should they have? Why should they take their social responsibility serious seriously? You know, the answer could be because for them, it's you know they have vested interest in appearing to be uh, socially conscious to kind of improve their brand image, um, to track attract consumers, um, so they're not boycotted. You know things like so they definitely have you know uh, a, a clear vested interest in you know we want to appear like we're doing the good thing and we're supporting these noble causes, and someone like um, Alan Sugar um, would say that actually you know that that kind of enterprise is um, you know maybe a company's unique selling point. You know a company like Lush, um, they have you know backdated you know decades of 
genuine or what seems like genuine um you know interest in protecting animals protecting the environment and that's a usb so they're making you know that's going to kind of help them make money great uh thanks both of you and just thinking about just what you were just saying there toby in fact lush was going through my head um although i think that often their usp is just having really smelly stores which i have to go into every christmas to get things for my wife but anyway then i have to run out after about five minutes because i can't breathe the air but that's another that's another matter right yeah so i think perhaps an interesting thing that goes through my head just as an idea for students to play around with is this this idea of genuine corporate social responsibility and people you know companies caring about things and you can care about things for lots of different reasons so it might be that people are genuinely i mean people who are employed in the company and perhaps the chief exec and the and the the shareholders are genuinely caring about the environment or genuinely caring about other people and their working conditions or whatever or they might be caring but instrumentally so caring in so far as if they if they put in lots of resources to help people in their working conditions and and have products that help protect the environment then it will help them sell more products in their company because other people will think they're a better company so there's two ways of caring and two ways of being genuine um, and it's very interesting to tease those apart what might describe as a kind of intrinsic caring and an instrumental caring but there's still both types of care and i suppose that's an interest yeah go on toby sorry i was just going to say like you know going back to lush and i i use them in a perhaps an unfair way um, because i would say that lush you know from from the outside they do seem to have a genuine care um, and I think you would you would kind of, you know, perhaps tease that out by looking at, you know, how long have they been caring? And a company like Lush, they've been caring since their inception. And they clearly have a, a, a culture in the company of of care for, you know, for animals and the environment and so on. Um, but then, you, you know, you could look at a company and, you know, probably dozens of large, large companies that do this when there's a particular issue, they kind of jump on board or when they, there's some kind of malpractice within the company, suddenly it's like, you know, like reform and you know, we'll do better. And you can kind of think those companies there, you know, they're the companies that are using it, the intrinsic, we're trying to keep our customers or, you know, make more money from it. Yeah, good. So yeah, that, that idea of caring, across different periods of time when conditions might change if they keep on caring in the same sort of way then it's probably a good indication that they really do care genuinely intrinsically about a thing it's not just there to help the company yeah okay great listen let's leave things there in that segment uh, both of you and uh, we'll see you in the next segment when we talk about uh, a few specific issues And welcome back. Uh, Before we move into this segment, uh, as I always do, it's just to remind you to check out my website, uh, Simon Kirchin, K-I-R-C-H-I-N. It's my personal website. If you look at the top, there's a number of tabs, and one of the tabs says Pod Schools. uh, And on that tab, I keep a list of topics normally up to date on what topics uh, I'm recording at the moment. Um, If you see a topic that's coming up and you've got questions or ideas about it, please feel free to email me with uh, those questions. We'd love to include them in uh, any of the recordings. If you've heard something and we've recorded it, uh, but you still want to ask them some questions, please email in. I'm sure I'm going to get some teachers back for some Q&A sessions where I can fire random questions at them, which which they're not aware of, and I can see if they can get any answers to them i'm sure toby and michael would love that so uh, we've been talking about uh, business ethics in general and talked about some big themes we've talked about group agency and corporate social responsibility so let's get to thinking about um, a couple of uh, specific issues that are also on the specification let's think first of all about whistleblowing which is something we hear a, a fair bit about in, in the news every so often um so toby do you want to explain to us what whistleblowing is and why it features uh, so heavily is something to think about yeah absolutely so start off with kind of yeah a definition of what it is so whistleblowing is when a, a worker an employee passes on information concerning wrongdoing within the you know the organization within the company that they work in 
Um, so that wrongdoing could be legal wrongdoing, could be moral wrongdoing. And according to the UK law, um, they have to kind of believe two things. They have to believe that they're acting in the public interest. So it's important there that they're not kind of airing like a grievance, a personal grievance. So, you know, someone didn't get the promotion they wanted. You know, that's not whistleblowing. That's just you being upset. Not, no, not relevant. And they have to believe that the disclosure that they're, you know, the thing that they're blowing the whistle on shows either past, present or likely future wrongdoing. Um, that wrongdoing could be a criminal offence like fraud. It can be a miscarriage of justice. It can be endangering health and safety of people or damage to the environment. Or it could be covering up any of those things. So that's what um, whistleblowing is. And typically you will you know, whistle, blow the whistle to maybe internally within your organization. So a lot of corporations and companies have whistleblowing policies, um, or at least, you know, we would hope, perhaps we might say the good ones do, and they will have a culture where it, you, it is open that, you know, you will be kind of, and I think we'll talk about this probably later, free from uh, repercussions if you do blow the whistle. And then other people have, you know, taken it upon themselves if they're perhaps not happy with the reaction that their company gives to their disclosure or they think that their company will try and cover it up, they might take it to an external body. Um, so it might be a regulatory body. It might be the media. Uh, and that's when things start to get a little bit more dicey. Sure. Okay, great. That's a really nice introduction. So Michael, can I hand the ball over to you then? So so what kind of interesting issues does whistleblowing raise then that, that we talk through with students? Yeah, I mean, at first viewing, a lot of students go, why is this an ethical issue? You are calling out people who are doing stuff that's immoral or illegal. But I guess the, the difficulty comes in terms of to what extent should you go to an external agency? Um, or, or what? Sorry, how soon should you go to an external agency? How, how, how many options and how much time has to uh, pass? What do you have to done internally before you go um, to an external agency? Is the problem sufficiently serious um, to warrant potential damage? Because obviously that's that's the moral issue is going public with a, a an illegal act or an immoral act could cause significant reputational harm to the company. But you've also got a contract between yourself and an employer. And I think illegal activities are probably more straightforward. But when they're an immoral activity, when a company is acting within the law and they've not done anything legal, when is it acceptable for you to potentially inflict huge reputational damage on something that you just believe to be morally wrong. And you again, you've signed a contract to say you're going to work for that company. You've signed a contract to say you've got a duty to that company. You've agreed it beforehand, working for them. So that's where the moral issues come. It's all about, you know, what issues do you whistleblow? Who do you whistleblow to? And then should you whistleblow at all if you've got a contract with that uh, company in particular? Good. Yeah, that's a really that's really helpful. And and so, how do students respond then? I mean, either of you, how do students respond then about that? It's kind of like issues of judgment, really, because I suppose you can blow the whistle. Particularly thinking about that that hard case of the immoral rather than the illegal. You know, how soon do you go? What processes do you go through? What do you ex- do you exhaust? And it, and are you should you be blowing the whistle or should you just quit the job and just just go and do something else and just just ignore it? I suppose. I mean, so a thought that comes to my head is the way you put it, Michael, so you've got a contract with that company, you've got a duty to them, but you've also got a duty as a citizen, I suppose, in the country. So I suppose there's, there's, there's those interesting clashes. So how, how do students respond then to, to the issue of whistleblowing? How do they conceive of it? I think most of, most of my students kind of, I guess they see it reasonably straightforward. They see themselves more as, you know, as you said, like global citizens than, you know, I am an employee of this company and, you know, I you know, everything I do should be devoted towards them. Um, I guess that maybe that that issue of loyalty um, to where you work perhaps doesn't exist as much. Um, so, you know, in terms of moral whistleblowing, I think that, you know, they're also quite happy to say, yeah, go through the internal processes because that's what they're there for and they've been set up in that way. And then if, you know, if it's a serious moral kind of infringement that's being made, then further action, you know, disclosing it to the public is absolutely necessary. So yeah, I think it's a difficult one because like I said, they do see it as a straightforward kind of moral issue. Um, you shouldn't blow the whistle on um, immoral and illegal activity. Um, but I, I use the bit of thinking of Norman Bowie, who, who basically said you have a prima facie duty of loyalty to your employer. And we, we really kind of explore that and go, well, 
do you? Is it an obvious, do you have an obvious duty to your employer um, and at all times? Um, because you basically said, you know, that is a contract is the is so fundamental to a business. All, all business activity is done on contracts. And if you were to allow breaches of contract within business, you know, or whistleblowing and other things, that is a, a dangerous precedent to set. So I often kind of give that as the alternative view. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call it Kantian, but it is that idea is can you universalize this act of whistleblowing or lack of loyalty to your company or putting your personal because sometimes you know we, we also have to accept that we are in a we have to be fairly confident in our actions we have to be confident in the evidence we've got and are you ever confident that the outcome will be better um or worse or are you sure that the issue is is warranted your your action and that's all very very difficult and i suppose presenting that idea is you have a prima facie du uh, a duty of loyalty and you need a really high bar and then it becomes a much more complex moral issue to consider. And, you know, I, I give examples. We all work, we've all worked in businesses probably where we've gone, not quite sure that's the best way of doing something. Not that it's immoral or illegal, but we go, I'm not really sure they're treating that person very well. Or, But it, it's it's much more difficult when you're actually in a business. And it's quite useful when you're teaching at, at um, A-level to ask students who've got jobs, have you seen something wrong in your business? And have you actually done anything about it? You know, is there something you've seen that you think, mm, not sure about that, or that that person is being treated quite badly? Because most of them will have had examples, particularly as teenagers, bosses not treating them particularly well. But when you ask them, you know, have you stood up to it? it? It becomes a much more kind of complex thing about standing up to authority and loyalty to a company and the personal cost of doing it as well, the potential personal cost of being believed and whether you're going to do it. So there's there's lots of kind of subtle things that you can tease out if you ask students about particularly their own experience at work or, or dealing in a workplace definitely no i think that's something that um students that last point don't often kind of realize or appreciate or, or you know or many people won't is that kind of the real life repercussions of whistleblowing and then when you actually look at the case studies of i guess large scale whistleblowing you know the repercussions for the individuals who blow the whistle are very very serious losing their job losing their um, house, divorce, imprisonment. So, you know, they're, they're dealing with very real life things. And often that doesn't kind of leap to mind straight away as actually the, the individual is going to have to really grapple with, is this worth it? Is this worth potentially losing my job? Is it worth potentially having my entire life thrown upside down to do this thing? Yeah. And I suppose then, I mean, going back to think, we mentioned this near, near, near the start, I think uh, you mentioned it, Toby. So we're looking for partly part of corporate social responsibility might also be kind of responsibility towards one's employees and making sure you've got good healthy robust internal processes to allow for whistleblowing um, within companies before people go externally in fact it's, it's kind of in the company's own interest to allow that to happen because then they can keep that sort of thing in-house but they're credible processes where people know that if they raise a problem it'll be treated seriously I suppose one thing going through through my head is that we're thinking very much about a single individual employee and then the company. But in fact, there, there will often be different views within a company. You might be raising a view and actually you might be doing it out of loyalty to a company. And you might find that some people are agreeing with you and other people aren't. And that's that's some that's kind of that makes things a bit messier as well. Uh, Michael. I think as well, it's in, it's important to link back to the, the conversation we had at the start about uh, group action. Because it could be that everyone's actions within a company are perfectly honourable or their aims are perfectly honourable, but the, the accumulated system has a really negative impact. So uh, I don't know if we've got time to go through the whole example, but um, I read a uh, philosopher Queens. I don't know if you've heard of it, various uh, female philosophers and their contribution over time. And I read about Iris Marion Young. Have you heard of Iris yes. Marion Young? Yeah. So she talked about structural injustice. So her book, A Responsibility for Justice, just gives an example of someone called Sandy, who's a single mother evicted from a house. She identifies a safe place to live, but it's far away from work. She buys a car, but then she can't afford the rent. Uh, she has a two year wait for support. Um, she then needs a three month deposit, which she can't afford, and she ends up homeless at the end of it. And I think what Iris Marion Young identifies is this isn't an unfortunate situation. It is morally wrong. But all people in that chain have treated her decently. No one has inflicted a harm against her. Um, there's no clear injustice, but the structure itself, a bit like liberation theology with structural sin, the structure itself can be quite negative. 
Um, so when you're blowing the whistle, it might not be any identifiable thing that you can point to. So you know, if you think of uh, oil and gas companies, the damage that they're doing to the environment, that's not necessarily intentional. That's, you know, you could argue it's not necessarily right. We're going to harm the environment. Or when you look at exploited workers, no one in a big company goes, I'm going to pick on some people in a poorer country today. I'm going to make their life difficult. It's just the outcome of many small decisions over the course of years that leads to this. And then who do you, where do you blow the whistle on that? How do you call that out? Who's going to be held responsible? And it, and what blowing the whistle might not necessarily bring change because it's a structural thing rather than individual actions that lead to that immoral outcome, I suppose. Yeah, this is the way we've always done things around here. Or this is the business model. That's just what this company is. And then the question is, you know, I mean, it's kind of blowing the whistle, but there's also just kind of internally going, well, why can't we do something differently and being being heard? Yeah, good. Uh, is there anything else to raise under whistleblowing? Um, anything we haven't covered? I was, I was looking earlier at the kind of work of a philosopher, Ronald uh, Dusker. I think I've said his surname right. And he kind of questions about whether companies are the kind of entities which loyalty can be owed to at all. Um, which is quite interesting to whistleblowing. So he says the loyalty, um, you know, is based on relationships that kind of go beyond self-interest. Um, so, you know, the company has its self-interest and it treats you, the employee, as a means to kind of make money and you, the employee, treat the company as a means to earn a wage. And he says that loyalty has to be beyond self-interest. It has to go towards self-sacrifice without any ex- um, expectation of, reward and that relationship doesn't exist between the employee and the employer so no loyalty can be given in his opinion to a company at all from an employee um, and he's got quite um uh, an almost a brutal quote he says there is nothing as pathetic as a loyal employee who haven't given um above and beyond is let go um so for him you know a company you can't show any loyalty to it at all and so for whistleblowing for him you know play the whistle it's a it's a nice thought actually and, and perhaps one the, the students can can ponder on which gets to often kind of the culture of different companies and corporations and be they kind of very large or medium-sized or smaller which is sometimes there'll be some companies that are that do try to be loyal towards their employees and it seems right therefore that you should go above and beyond back but then there are some companies that are just based, I mean, as Michael mentioned this a few times earlier, just based on the contract, right? Here's a contract. You do this number of hours work. You do these kind of tasks, whatever it is. We'll give you this salary and these other things every week, every month, every year. And then there's, you know, a week and let you go when we want to. There's this month's, this, this amount of month's notice and that's it. And so that that's a very different sort of culture <laughs> as, you know, if you've been in the working place in various different organisations, you'll understand what I mean. Yeah, go on, Michael. Yeah, I, I thought I've written that down because I've, I've not heard that argument before and I do like it, but I do question whether you can do ethics like that. So you only, you only show virtues to the people you feel deserve virtues or companies that have treated you well. You know, I, I, I like it as a principle, but I just thought, I don't know if you could apply that one company. Oh, they've treated me quite well, so I'll be loyal. The other company, oh, they didn't pay me over time, so I'll blow the whistle on you guys. Um, so, you know, I, I just I wonder how that would work in practice is all. Yeah, good. Okay, something for students to ponder then, to think about different sorts of, of company and working culture. Let's move on to another topic that's there on the on the spec, going from uh, whistleblowing to then a kind of very big topic in, in more than one sense globalization so globalizations on on the on the specification so so what's going on there and what what do you guys talk about with with your students around globalization i guess first of all kind of establishing what it is and that it's the kind of the the eroding of territorial kind of basis for social economic political activities so kind of to break that down you know give some examples the the eroding of geography right, in terms of, I guess, knowing what's happening in the world. The other day, I was watching, you know, sitting on my sofa on Twitter, um, Sri Lankan protesters storm their, you know, president's palace. And I was doing that from Oxford. That was happening in um, Sri Lanka. So, you know, we had these events, which we could call global events, you know, 9-11, quite a few years ago now, 20 years ago. But 
the world kind of experienced that in some way. You know, it's on every single television screen, front of every single newspaper. Um, so it's accessible to millions and millions of people. So that's kind of one aspect of globalization. Another one in terms of products, you know, I can buy the same Apple phone anywhere in the world, drink the same Coca-Cola anywhere in the world. So, you know, products are available you know, instantly, immediately, halfway across the world. Um, and then another kind of aspect of globalization, the globalization of money, you know, of the kind of global economy. Uh, you know, I don't need a bank, as I might have done however many years ago, uh, to kind of physically have my money if I want to you know, get it. I can go to a, a bank in Vietnam or in uh, Argentina and access my money. I can, you know, sit in Tokyo and buy something to be shipped to my house in Oxford from Canada. So all of these kind of things kind of paint the picture of what globalization is. It's that, you know, eroding of geographical boundaries, the interconnectedness of the world. Great. Thanks, Toby. And so think about somebody who's not teaching business ethics at school. Then, I mean, the way you set it up, does it is basically the, the, the question, and is this a good thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. OK. So so how, how do students re- respond to that question? Can they get their heads around it? And um, yeah, I'll, I'll just expand on what Toby said. I think it's, it's important to think of all the links in the chain of a business and how globalisation affects the moral moral decisions of everyone in that chain. So when shareholders were making decisions years ago, they were affecting a certain number of people that they could drive down the road to and go and see in their factory in Birmingham or somewhere else. Whereas now it's happening to faceless people millions of miles away that they'll never meet and they're disconnected by a whole chain of holding companies and chains same with employees like we um you could be employed my brother works in cornwall he's employed by someone in kent um because of the technology similar to what we're using today but other people can work for companies in america on on the trains in kent at the minute there's adverts for people working for facebook in britain uh you can be employed by anyone in the world um and also consumers like i said earlier we're a stakeholder in google it affects our lives in the company in california so working through each stage and thinking about how our moral obligations have changed that i think that's an important process to go through and, and the impact and i think you know the you could go through many many different pros and cons of, of globalization um mcdonald's is always a go-to for me you know being able to go all over the world and you have they, they try and change their menus depending on the country they're in but you can always you know it's a good thing sometimes you go to a country and you go i want to know what i'm getting I know that company, I know what I'm getting is, is reasonable and I know what it's going to be. And those those are really good. And people have similar experiences. You can talk to people about similar ideas, similar media, similar uh, foods, and, and it kind of can bring people together in a, in a positive sense. So, yeah, we're, we're concerned with uh, events in Sri Lanka, whereas before we would have been waiting three, four, five weeks for that news to arrive. And before we had an opinion on it, it's gone and we can't affect it. But now with social media, we can affect it. So there are positive things in terms of bringing people together, a common experience, encouraging the idea that we're all human and we all experience the same things because we're talking to people from all over the world. So there are some many, many positive things that globalisation has brought. I don't know if someone else wants to go and give the other side of the negative. or Yeah, I mean, I can have a think about some negatives. I guess one, often we find with globalisation that uh, labour is outsourced to you know developing nations so the downside for that is let's say we have a factory in, in in the uk and the corporation that owns that factory and employs those people decide that they're going to move their factory to a developing nation obviously the downside for those people who work in the factory in the uk is they've just lost their job however you know that has the kind of contrasting positive that a load of other people have just been employed um, in that developing nation However, that comes with its own issues that we see kind of time and time again in terms of uh, developing nations often having less stringent regulations in terms of working conditions, pay, who's allowed to work, you know, what age you're allowed to work. But also in terms of things as simple as the, you know, the building structure of buildings. There was that case, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, which collapsed and it was a, a a factory that supplied Primark and Walmart, and there, you know there was a large cracks appeared in the in the floor of the factory, and workers were told to you know go back to work. It's fine, and it had happened, and it, and, and it ended up collapsing. But it happened because floors had been built without permits. 
you know, regulations either weren't there in place to make sure the structure was safe. And it's all those sorts of things that eventually lead ultimately to, you know, to, to death, especially in that case. So those are, I guess, some some negatives. Yeah, good. Thanks, Toby. And just some thoughts from me, I suppose. I mean, so, so general thoughts that there's that whole perspective on uh, just hearing both of you explain it, whether we think of ourselves as global citizens and connected to people who are, you know, very similar to us. They've just been born in a different place and, you know, they're, they're human beings or whether local ties are really important. I was struck by, Michael, when you're introducing it, you know, the, the company might previously have known some of its factory workers, but then it outsources it and it's then just these faceless people thousands of miles away. And that. I mean, from a business point of view and a spreadsheet and thinking about, you know, actually it's, it's going to cost us less because, you know, perhaps the health and safety measures are not as stringent as, as Toby was just indicating. But then you lose those local ties. You don't know the, who these people are. And that can disrupt whole local communities. Uh, and I suppose then, so what, does anyone ever put this argument? I was struck by this when, when as Lobi, Toby was uh, reminding us of that, that incident in Bangladesh from a few years ago. So some people sometimes say, yes, so it's, it's bad doing all this outsourcing. But if you want to ensure that health and safety is better for workers in other countries, best thing to do is to get big Western companies from developed nations going out there. And then they will put pressure on the local government to say, we're going to employ your people, but there have to be these health and safety measures in place. And that's really going to be one of the best ways to get building regs as the, as they should be. Does that ever come up in 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 class at all? Uh, yeah, I mean it does, and I think um, I don't think we mentioned it by name, but we mentioned it in the first part. Good ethics, good business. But people don't want the negative the negative connotations of exploitation or poor working conditions. Um, and I suppose again, it goes back to 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 what extent is genuine corporate responsibility genuine? And um, back to Toby's uh, quote from Alan Sugar deal with the greatest minds on this podcast um but you know he said what's your us and i think unfortunately that's where the argument fails for me is that it it requires people to care and if primark and walmart are the cheap company where you can get your cheap clothes that is they don't need to be ethical because people are going to buy from them you know amazon are the convenient they can drop it off to the lockers you can pick it up at a time of your choosing that is their unique selling point and that's kind of where i think that argument kind of falls down is that you know primark did outsource their production to that company. Have they faced serious market problems since? I'm not that I'm aware of. Maybe I'm not keeping up with my uh, financial times recently, but I, I'm not aware that they faced any particular difficulties. But I, I do understand that argument. And and if you look at the global data, conditions are improving around the world and people are becoming better off. But yeah, it's I think it's a complicated one. I don't think it's a slam dunk argument for me. Yeah, I would I would echo that. I think it definitely that those changes you know what you were saying simon is getting those western companies in these countries to improve working conditions i think that change ultimately has to come from or the pressure for change has to come from the consumer you know because as michael said businesses will get away with what they can in the pursuit of profit in a you know in a, in a cynical take so the consumer has to say no actually i'm not happy with this i want you to act in this way you know we can again as michael said we kind of question as to whether that's happened um, or happening or whether we're just kind of happy with the convenience of you know, I want to own an Apple phone. I don't really care that it was. Um, there's a factory where owned by a company Fox, Foxconn, um, and they operate out of Taiwan. And 40% of all consumer electronics are made in, by this company. So if you have an iPhone or a, a Google phone or you know, a PlayStation or Xbox, chances are it was made by this company, uh, very, very likely. And they've had for years, a couple of decades, very high rates of um, employee suicide because of the really poor working conditions. It's gone down in recent years, um, but that might be because uh, in 2016, they announced they had automated 50% of their workforce. So, you know, there's another kind of issue, I, I guess, to do with business ethics as well. But do we care that, you know, we're getting or we're getting an iPhone that's made by this company, which has such poor working conditions, their employees are, you know, ending their own lives, Apparently not, because Apple's you know a ludicrously successful company. No, I suppose this is possibly moving us on beyond globalization, but it is again who is responsible. 
So we've kind of alluded to the fact that we are responsible as consumers for not making ethical choices. But then, as you pointed out, there are some businesses where you can't make an ethical choice because small companies dominate the market. Like there is that famous, if you just Google corporations, you can see all the little brands that are ultimately owned by about seven. And you think, right, Mm -hmm. if I don't want to buy from that brand, oh, I'm just going to buy from another corporation or that brand is actually owned through various means by the same corporation and it really becomes difficult to pinpoint again the responsibility we need to do need to take responsibility as consumers and i know that and i buy things because it's convenient and i do think should have gone to my local bookshop for that shouldn't have gone to amazon but it was convenient and it, i can pick it up in my locker down the road um, and we do have to take responsibility but then at the same time because amazon have put a lot of book, bookshops out of business the bookshops that are around me might not have the stuff that i want so I don't actually have a choice if I want to buy that particular product. So it's, it's really difficult to, to identify who is responsible. And that's a really good discussion to have in class as well, is who is ultimately responsible for all these issues that we, we talk about. We kind of as consumers have to take some part of that responsibility where we can, but it's not as easy as, as that either. Great. Uh, thanks, both of you. OK, let's leave it there and we'll pick up uh, a few more issues and think about how all this relates to common ethical theories in the next segment. And welcome back. We've been thinking through lots of different topics in business ethics. We were just talking about globalisation and we've gone to the topic of um, being consumers. And that's also there in the in the spec, uh, the extent to which we're consumers, uh, and the question of the extent to which capitalism is helpful, whether it's a good way to organise society. Um, I'm just wondering, both of you, maybe Michael, how you tackle that sort of very big, broad question in the in the classroom, and how how students re- respond to it. Well, I think to, to give it a positive spin to begin with. I think we think about the, the benefits of things like globalisation and big corporations in terms of, for, for, for many people, not all, but many people, some form of secure employment, some money coming in, uh, the goods that we want. And we think back to history and where you're struggling every, every winter and every summer to make sure you've got enough food to see you through the year. Um, you know, you're living in a very kind of hand to mouth existence. So we think about the positive things. And I ask students, you know, does that free us up to pursue other goals, to pursue other things in our lives? Can we then want now that our general needs, thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you do psychology or business studies, kind of if capitalism can provide us with those basic necessities, does it then free us up to explore other goals and other things? And we can move our mental energy away from just survival to actually flourishing and and moving beyond and some people say capitalism does that even even at the lower end of the spectrum as we touched on with globalization if those people have got a job instead of no job that is an improvement into their material conditions and that's going to help them then flourish and then if businesses invest in uh, countries that are underdeveloped then those can develop and those people can live better lives so i suppose that would be the argument for how capitalism can help people to flourish is by addressing those those needs that you know for most of history we can't forget where we were you know struggling to survive the vast majority of people so that's where i start with that i think Uh, and toby yeah students can see that you know often have students who might do something like economics as well um and they'll be aware you know for example you know nine about in 1970s china opened up its economy and since then about 800 million people i think have been lifted out of poverty you know in china alone and so clearly that's a, a huge positive in terms of, you know, globalization and opening, you know, countries up to the global market um, and to capitalism. I guess students often kind of want to think about that capitalism, you know, perhaps seems to be working better for some people than it does for other people. And, you know, I guess it's particularly, you know, at the moment, you know, going through a kind of cost of living crisis. But then even kind of the questioning whether or not this trickle down theory um, of economics and capitalism is actually working. Um, you know, is, is it does it trickle down to the bottom or as we've seen in the past kind of couple of decades, the, you know, the ultra rich, the you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk becoming even more rich and kind of, you know, doubling their you know, infinite wealth um, where their, you know, their workers are still paid minimum wage. 
yeah, I think any system where you've got people with a space program or paying people minimum wages, you go ask questions about the bare minimum, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that was just going through my head, actually, that particular example, um, as Toby was speaking. I suppose, I mean, certainly when I do, um, certainly, I mean, at Kent, we run a third year module about themes in politics and economics, so philosophical themes. And we get students in at some point in the course to think about the the absolute uh, quality of life um, in the way you were just uh, indicating, uh, Michael, you know, lifting it out of kind of a very basic hand-to-mouth agrarian existence. And then that kind of comparison, so relatively how well off are we, which then gets us into Elon Musk and, and, and other people. Um, and so and there's some very interesting economic studies there about um, once you've once you've hit a certain level of standard of life, then you start comparing yourself, partly through media as well, media influence, start comparing yourself with other people. And actually that can, even though materially you're better off, psychologically you don't feel as if you are because you're you're seeing all these other people with this, this vast amount of, of wealth. Um, um, it's a silly point to make perhaps, but I, I sometimes uh, illustrate to students the difference between a million and a billion. Because if, if they don't understand and uh, if they don't understand that, then big numbers just don't mean anything. So it's, it's useful to look at in seconds. So a million seconds is 12 days and a billion seconds is 31 years. So I know that's a really silly example. But when you're talking about billionaires, it's not people who've just got a lot of money. You know, they've got more money than you can possibly know what to do with. And I think that it's just worth particularly kids who don't do business studies or don't do economics, those numbers can be quite baffling at times. And it's a, a fact that I enjoy. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's an interesting one to consider. But very interesting one. Yeah, good shorthand to to remember. So can I ask the, the two of you as well again think about your teaching and, and your students? So just that that very idea of being a consumer, um, because that does come up a, a couple of times in the in the spec. And do students reflect on that? Because so, I mean, I've seen changes in my life, but not not dramatic changes. But, you know, if you take a longer view of history, you can see bigger changes that we, we think of ourselves primarily, many of us, as being consumers of all sorts of things. So consumers of products that we buy from supermarkets or consumers of media content or perhaps consumers of ideas that we're learning in business ethics or, or whatever, whatever it is. And it's kind of consumers, consumer, consumer. And that's our conception of ourselves almost. And do, do you guys talk about whether that's a healthy conception of human beings or whether there's there's other aspects of our lives that that we just, it, it's unhelpful to think of us as consumers and in fact we should be contributors or we should be something else? I, I think I think student, my students are kind of aware that they are consumers um, and they kind of, they know that, um, whether that be, you know, consuming fast fashion or, um, as you said, kind of like some sort of media I, I don't like the word content, but media content. And they're aware of that. Um, and they might kind of accept that a little bit begrudgingly. But again, kind of this idea of kind of ethical consumerism to what, you know, they're not they're not too fussed to kind of go out of their way to, I guess, change that fact. Um, whether that's because it's a lot of effort to kind of consume in a in an ethical way or it's as Michael was saying before, you know, it's convenient to kind of click on something and have it arrive the next day rather than go out of your way to try and find it. And so kind of that, that those issues of consumption, um, you know, they're aware that they consume a lot or they are consumers, but, you know, I think they accept that it's the status quo. I think what's tricky as well is that while I don't agree and I don't like being called a consumer, I think particularly for young people, that is their power is being a consumer they have the power to buy from companies or not or consume certain content and not if they don't they don't vote until they're 18 you know they've got no political clout you know in a capitalist society our consumerism is our power in some and i sorry i feel a bit you know <laughs> conflicted saying that but it, it, it is it is something to consider as well and it's it's a tricky thing because it's it's very easy just to go well we don't want to be called consumers but then there is some there's a different angle on that i suppose isn't there about how we can influence things and there have been successful boycotts um, and companies have had to change their policies and companies have uh, been very wary of upsetting particularly youth uh, companies of having bad image and um, social justice issues and various things if they don't want to be on the wrong side of that debate so it, is, it can be quite empowering to see yourself as a consumer as well at the same time. Good. 
Can I move us on then to a, to a different topic, which I'm intrigued by? I'm intrigued by how you guys approach it, which is how this relates to common normative ethical theories. So, uh, you know, so utilitarianism, Kantian deontology and, and so on. And, you know, how, how you kind of bring those into business ethics, where you see a connection, whether there's there's some grit there, whether Kantian deontology does better or utilitarianism does better and, and what the students make of it. So anyone want to kind of have a go at introducing this for us? Yeah, I, I distinguish two things when I talk about the application of ethical theory. So I think about the kind of questions you could be asked. And there's a, there's a question that you could ask, be asked about um, the appropriateness of, say, utilitarianism or Kantian ethics. So that is how easy is it to apply that ethical theory to the issues? And there's the other one about the effectiveness. So do you agree with the outcomes that it gives you? So depending on how you're addressing the question, you're going to come up with different strengths and weaknesses. So if you're looking at how applicable they are, utilitarianism with its calculus is a much more comfortable fit for business ethics because they deal with accounts and pros and cons and risk and cost and all those sorts of things. So on a purely practical level, utilitarianism, I think, is a a more comfortable fit. But whether you agree with the outcomes it gives you, uh, that's a a separate issue. And with Kantian ethics, it's a slightly less easy fit because, like we talked about, it's difficult to talk about intention and goodwill and duty when you're dealing with a corporation or a collection of individuals. But again, there are things about Kantian ethics that, with its high standard, I do think have some valuable stuff to say about business ethics. But I think, again, it depends on how, what, what kind of you're using the ethical theory to do. Um, I don't know if Toby wants to come in on, on anything that I've said at all. I think in terms of just opening it up to students for discussion, I think kind of examples you know, illustrate, you know, as Michael was saying, the way in which different the, the two different ethical theories lend themselves or not to business ethics. Um, so, you know, at first sight, it might seem that companies, you know, operate from a utilitarian framework, I guess, at first sight. Um, and you can look at examples of the the Ford Pinto case in you know, 1970, where they found that a lot of that there was, you know, serious design flaw in their car that when it was kind of, uh, there was a rear end collision, the engine exploded and so Ford did this cost benefit analysis where you know how much would it cost us to recall all of the cars how much will we get sued um, and all this kind of stuff and found out that it's better to just kind of let them go out and you know hopefully not too many people will die in the explosion um, and so you know that's you know a, a kind of working from a utilitarian framework of a cost benefit analysis in terms of maximizing profit for the company. So I think, you know, kind of thinking about it in terms of those examples um, kind of helps draw out the, you know, the, the differences of what a utilitarian or a Kantian would say. Great. Yeah. So in fact, thinking if you're a company, then it's going to be very consequential, certainly for many companies, because in the end, they're just going to care about the bottom line, which is the, the outcome. With rule utilitarianism, then, um, then there's the possibility of, of having some sort of rules that look uh, a bit more moral i suppose but in the end it's still going to be the outcome and the and the bottom line that's going to be um working out um what you should be what you should be doing and what rules medium level rules or whatever we call them you one should be adopting um but yeah i can i can see how it's kind of hard to bring in Kantian ethics but it might be easier to then understand as michael was saying and be understanding that the very idea of kind of group agency and group intention and group responsibility if you're bringing in, in Kantian ethics. So is there anything that we haven't yet covered in, in our discussions that it's worth us uh, just thinking about? I think we could have a, a, a think about keeping on kind of Kantian utilitarianism about how Kantian ethics does apply to some aspects quite well of business ethics. So if I bring it back to um, when we're talking about stakeholder theory, the idea that a company has responsibilities to not just shareholders, but to you know their employees, uh, in community, the local community, suppliers, governments. You know they're all stakeholders, and so kind of suggesting that this they're not simply you know tools for production. You know they're not being treated as a means to an end. You know for the employee or the supplier or whatever it is. So in, t- in that kind of sense, Kantian ethics can be directly applied and it's quite useful because, you know, it, it removes that possibility for a business to 
exploit a, an employee or to kind of cheat on a contract with a supplier or to kind of dodge regulations. It removes the possibility of coercion um, and things like that. But it also means that businesses are kind of have to, um, you know, from a Kantian approach, not just not exploit their employees, but allow them to have the freedom to, to develop as moral and rational beings, right? It kind of, so in practical terms, pay them enough money so that it's not just a minimum wage, it's a living wage. Give them the working conditions which they have the autonomy in their job where they can flourish in that way. So I think Kantian ethics in terms of stakeholder theory you know, is is quite useful, uh, quite a useful pairing. I flip, every time I teach it, every year I flip between: am I utilitarianism? Uh, am I utilitarian, or am I more towards Kantian ethics? Um, and this year I'm a Kantian when it comes to business ethics. So I think there's two considerations: do I think it's possible to apply Kant to all the business uh, issues? It's very difficult. But do I think if businesses aimed to be run along Kantian lines, would they be fundamentally better? I come down on yes in in that. Um, you know, it is difficult because obviously you're dealing with profit and that, you know, that is the, not a motivation that Kant would recognise, you know, the goodwill and duty. But if companies did pay more attention to goodwill and duty, they would probably be better. But that might be, you know, being t- too unfair to utilitarianism because, again, yes, you're talking about profit, but does profit equal happiness? Does profit, e- you know, because that's not equally shared and that's not equally distributed. So utilitarianism can provide a, a robust challenge to some of these business ethic issues as well. I think it probably fits better with the good ethics is good business, for striking that balance between the two. Um, but I would say Kantian ethics does provide that real challenge. And I think that's something the kids also think on, on first viewing, they don't think Kantian ethics is the best approach. But when you look at those um, various different issues all the way through, it does have some real strengths to it. Um, I think the only thing that I would, a bit of a, a bit of detail as well, the, is it the second formulation of the categorical imperative, mere means. And I think that's important when you're thinking about business ethics, because what it means by mere means is you can, people can serve a means to an end, but that can't be their only purpose. So yes, you are employing someone for profit, of course you are, but as long as it's not just for that reason and as long as there's robust contracts and agreements in place, then obviously the Kantian ethics would approve of that. And that's something that sometimes students don't quite get because they think, well, you can't employ anyone because then you're using them to, as a means to an end. Mm-hmm. But it's that mere means that I think is just important to draw people's attention to as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll go into bat for Kantian ethics on business ethics this year. If you did it again next year, I might be back to utilitarianism. I don't know. Okay, we, we, we'll have you back for a and a with... with <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, just to say, I mean, I mean, not just business ethics, but when I'm teaching deontology and Kant at uh, university level, I kind of kind of spend a lot of time just emphasising that word mere, <laughs> just to get it into everyone's head. It's really, really important to, to understand that. I mean, Kant kind of is, I was going to say man of the world. He wasn't really a man of the world, but he understood enough that that um, his ethics was kind of, you know, located in a society, understood how people operated, you know, in relation to each other. Um, it was just, but the, the word mere there is really, really, really crucial. Listen, I think that's probably a, a good um, point to, to end things. Uh, thanks both of you for, for being with us. Michael, thanks for, for appearing again. It's good to have you. No, thank you for having me back. Thank you very much. And, and Toby, thanks for coming on as well. Absolutely pleasure. Really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Great. And uh, thanks to you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And all being well, you'll listen to some more of our episodes on Philosophy Gets Schooled.